Hello folks, welcome and happy new year to everyone. Hope you've had a great holiday season. We're very happy to have today with us Preston Crow Chief on the topic of what we learned in Afghanistan and also his personal experience of being in the military. Preston Crow Chief is from the Blood Triper Nation. He joined the Canadian military in July 9th, 2005. The program he joined through was Bald Eagle, which is a basic military qualification course designed for First Nation entry. After he completed his training, Preston was transferred to the 20th Independent Field Battery, Royal Canadian Artery, serving on deployment to Afghanistan in 2009-2010, with the current rank of Sergeant. He graduated from the University of Lethbridge with a general management degree and now works with the Blood Tribe Housing and Accounts Payable Clerk. Preston currently lives on the Blood Reserve with his son. Preston, I want to thank you very much for joining us today and look forward to hearing what you have to share with us. All right, moving on with my story right away. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me, uh, Anne Louise. Uh, so yeah, my, uh, my journey started exactly like I said in my bio, uh, July 9th, 2005. Uh, basically I was, I was 16 years old when I joined the primary army reserves and, uh, you know, why I joined, uh, I've always was growing up wanting to be in the army and wanted to explore the world, travel. And, um, I, uh, yeah, I thought as soon as I saw the recruiter, you know, um, I thought we had to wait till we we're done high school. I had that old thought, right. And then the recruiter, he was like, yeah, you just need your parents' approval, signature. And uh, there's this, you know, First Nation. And my, even my high school teacher, he said, hey, you should go talk to this guy. So I filled out the paperwork and, uh, you know, lots of arguments between my mother and I. And she finally signed off on the paperwork to go, right? And uh, it was pretty interesting. My dad was pretty chill with it. So, but yeah, they, my parents gave me approval to go ahead. And I did the interviews. And, um, you know, it's really funny, but, like, you think when I first joined, I always remember it too. I went to this like in my high school room. All the native students are in there, right? And they're all like listening to the recruiter. I think they were all in there just to kind of get away from class. <laughs> all my peers and everyone was like, "Yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna join the army and we're gonna go all do all these great things." I'm like, "Wow, a, a lot of people want to be in the military, you know?" And uh, mixing out of like there must have been like 60 of us in this room, right? And then I think I'm the only one that actually went forward with the whole paperwork process and. Uh, and uh, yeah, it was interesting. And I always remember doing the interview and um, uh, talking to the uh, officers and whatnot. And I always found that to be a very proud moment to kind of, you know, step forward to be like, you know, I'm going to do it. And kind of realizing I was the only one who did step forward and answered the call. <laughs> so, and uh, so, um, yeah, I did that. And that would have been like February uh, 20, 2005. And uh, they wanted me to finish my high school credits. You have to have at least 33 credits, if I remember correctly. And uh, I got those done. And then, uh, yeah, and I got a letter in the mail saying, you know, be up in Wainwright on a certain date. And uh, it was kind of last minute thing, right? And it was like, because uh, high school um, summer is like July, August, you get off. So it's so the last minute, July, went up to Camp Wainwright. And uh, the funny part is, I remember when I first joined, I didn't know how big Canada's military was so you know I, I just I thought maybe they had like one big base I don't know I knew nothing about Canada's military realistically I didn't but I could watch all the American uh, war movies and hear all their famous camps and whatnot but Canada doesn't really do that right but next thing you know uh, I get on a bus or not a bus this driver came to pick me up down on my reserve me and uh, a few others six others and uh, yeah we started driving up and uh it's kind of funny that I think my friends, they probably like, they slept the whole drive up, but I was, I was too excited. Uh, I, I stayed up with the driver, talking with him, asking all sorts of questions. You know, I was really excited to get my journey started. And uh, I didn't even know Wainwright was a town. So the, the base is called Canadian Forces Base Wainwright, but, you know, because of the town. So that was, uh, that was neat. And uh, yeah, I always remember going up, going there, and then they start issuing all your stuff, right? And, uh, you know, welcome to Bold Eagle 16 and our, our, our course officer is pretty chill dude. And uh, I always remember looking at, I don't know why, but you look at the instructors and they're all standing there in a group. And I'm like, 
oh man, I hope I don't have that guy. You know, there was the scary sergeant. He looked the part, right? It's, you know, what you see on the Hollywood movies. I'm like, hey, go figure. That was the guy I got assigned to. And I'm like, man, oh man. <laughs> he, he was, uh, he was very firm with us. And, uh, but what, what I want to talk about in Bold Eagle is, um, it's a, I'm really grateful that I went through Bold Eagle. Um, cause I did my basic training with other first nation, uh, personnel from across Canada. Uh, if I remember correctly, there was like, geez, I think there was like 56 graduates and six people, um, couldn't complete the training for various reasons. And, uh, yeah, I made, I met a lot of good friends from there and we used to still Facebook buddies and whatnot. And I, uh, what I really liked about Bold Eagle is, um, they had a, a cultural awareness week, right? So it's a six week program. There's one week where you spend uh, basically learning from the elders in that area. So a lot of Cree elders. And that, at this point in my life, too, I, I knew nothing about the Cree culture myself, being from the Bud Indian Reserve. And so I found that really unique, how they set up their stuff and talking to their elders. And they are telling me how they set up their teepee. And, you know, I thought that was very knowledgeable. And, uh, you know, how they smoke their pipe, peace pipes and how they do their sweat lodges and their songs and uh, you know it's all the same but like just they do things just a little bit different and, and it was really nice to see those elders and throughout the course they uh, the military delegated two elders to kind of be the uh the i don't know the elders for the course um I, I call it the equivalent of having a padre right so the military has padres so i thought that was really nice i'm like hey you know what like uh, every sunday we get our elders hour uh, some opt to do the uh, Padre hour, right? Or they can go to church. But I'd always want to go talk to those those uh, Cree elders, and they're really nice people. They're pretty chill, and um, so you know they have their hand drums and whatnot, and uh, smudge and prayer. And uh, yeah, it was just nice having those encouragements. I kind of felt like they were my parents in a way, so it was pretty cool. Um, but yeah, they do the one week of culture culture awareness training, and uh, it's really nice. Uh, the the instructors on my course. Um, the one guy said he knew nothing about native people, right. And doing all of the culture week, he's like, he's like, wow, I didn't ever knew you guys did all this stuff. And, you know, it was like, kind of like, we made it easier to bond with your instructors. Um, and it, it kind of, for me anyways, made it easier to be like, well, okay, these guys are legit. They're willing to learn about us and, you know, I'm gonna go ahead, you know, all right, I'll follow you blindly into learning how to march and do drill and, uh, but yeah, I, I, it, was, it was a really nice way of uh, earning respect from one another. I so, um, but yeah, the training was itself was uh, after that. It was kind of cool. There's a ceremony too, right at the end of the culture awareness week. They had us all form up, and then they're like, "All right, okay." And then I remember there was the, uh, the this colonel standing there, lieutenant colonel, and he like the elders say, "Okay, see you later. We'll pick you up in like six weeks," <laughs> and then they like march you, big U turn. And you kind of go on the army side, right? And then you go on the army side, and then that's like kind of like the ceremony to like you're now doing army stuff. And the uh, the native people are giving Canada, you know, our our youth to to train. And I I always found that a really cool little ceremony to kind of go through. I'm like, wow, cool. I don't think anybody else does this, right? And uh, yeah, then the training starts right from there, right? And it's all like you will speak when spoken to, and you know, and uh, yeah. polish your boots and. Uh, but yeah, I go on that course and, uh, you know, I didn't, oh man, I, I, I thought I knew how to clean a, keep a clean room, but you know, you have to keep your clean room and, uh, make your bed every day, you know, uh, and it's different not having at that point in my life, not having my mom tell me to clean my room or make my bed or wash my laundry. I didn't even know how to wash laundry. Hey, uh, I, I, I didn't know that you should wash whites by themselves. So I, I threw a red shirt in there and all my socks came out pink. So. It's how uh, rookie I was at life in general. And, uh, but yeah, the, the training, we got pretty close. Um, I learned how to shoot a C7 rifle. And uh, I, I always found it really funny because I kept thinking we we're going to get M16s. And uh, I thought we were going to throw grenades and, you know, do a lot of cool stuff. But realistically, we just learned how to march, dress and deportment, uh, a lot about hygiene, 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 how to take care of ourselves, how to work with others, uh, the uh, teamwork, right? And I, um, yeah, and then it was just, uh, it was just different. I, uh, went to finished our, our range. It just seemed like the course got easy, but it, 
kind of, if I remember correctly, the, the military does a good job of breaking you down and rebuilding you back up. And it, I don't know why, but it always seemed like I was always tired, um, cold and wet. <laughs> and I always remember we went to the field, even though it was only like a three day exercise, but you know, when, you, when you're brand new to being in the elements and all night, all day. Uh, and of course, for some odd reason, the joke is the base commander knows I don't turn on the, the rain switch and it was just raining the whole time. And um, we came back. I, I'd never been so tired in my life, but like uh, I remember half of us, we were trying to take notes. I can't even remember what the what the lecture was on. This is like maybe week four and a half of being on course. I, I don't remember anything about the lecture, but we are like, we all go to the back of the room because we're almost falling asleep, sitting down, taking notes. And, and uh, there I am standing and I'm like trying to stay awake, trying to stay awake, pounding back the water. And then, you know, it's like everyone's like, are you OK? And I'm like, I'm on the ground. I'm like, oh, my goodness, <laughs> I fell asleep. <laughs> so, so you know, it, it's interesting to, to see where you put your your, your mind and body. And then, uh, of course, for me, I, I think I sorry, of course, loneliness set in. Right. And I'm like, well, I never realized so just a punk and uh, everyone's going through life and you know lots of happens and so yeah once i finished that training um it's really nice at the end of the training uh you know you get your certificate you get paid it's pretty cool um some of those guys didn't know we were getting paid and they're like we're getting a check and i was like man you guys are crazy <laughs> and uh but at the end of it it was really nice they had a uh, an end ceremony where they formed us up and then the then the military marches us back onto the elder side as a kind of like a you know hey thanks for your youth for being here and you know hopefully they find some life skills to carry on when, with their lives and uh, and that's what I really liked about it is uh, uh, about the course too is um, they never it wasn't mandatory to continue on your training at the end of the course you have an interview with your uh, course officer or the the one the person who's in charge of the whole program and they just ask do you want to continue training? Because if you do, Crow Chief, uh, there's a unit in Lethbridge. And I was only 16 at the time, and I thought, well, uh, geez, that's a lot of driving going back from standoff to Lethbridge, down to Lethbridge. And, and he's like, well, the Army helps you out with a uh, travel allowance, so if that'll help. And I thought, you know what? Why not? Let's do it, right? I don't want to do this. Let's go on. So for me, on paper, uh, it's, for me, it's just a unit transfer, so I didn't have to do the whole remustering, didn't have to do basic all over again. Everything just transferred. So it was like your paperwork's now going to be part of the, uh, at the time, 18th Air Defense Regiment, which later became the 20th Air Defense Field Battery. Uh, so yeah, that, and then they marched us, gave us back to the, the to the elders, and that was it. Went home and then uh, joined the 20th Air Field Battery, and then, geez, it just seemed like as soon as I showed up, they're like, all right, you're doing your soldier qualification in Calgary, and then you're going to go do your DP1 in Red Deer, and you're going to learn about the artillery and uh, and then at that time, it was really interesting seeing the, the unit that I'm a part of. They were transitioning from a reg regular force base to a reservist unit. So just the difference in uh, mentalities is kind of what I had to go through. And uh, from there, uh, they uh, sent me for do my tech training, um, reconnaissance technician for the artillery. And, uh, and so it's like funny being a tech for the artillery is different because like, you know, the, the big cannons, right? I always thought like, hey, uh, I don't know who sets these up, but humans do, right? So, and then when I did my tech training to understand how it all works, I'm like, wow, there's a lot of math in this job, you know? <laughs> Being in the artillery, there's a lot of math. So my high school teacher would always kind of be in the back of my mind, like, yeah, you know, math, the, 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 the math and everything. So I'm glad I pay attention to math class. Uh, so yeah, I, I ended up, at the end of the day, my trade is gunner, and uh, which carries on into my, uh, I wanted to deploy overseas. And uh, it's really weird how they ask you if you want to go overseas. It's not like uh, in the U.S. where they have this lottery, right? And your lottery comes up, you got a number, right? And you're like, okay, this people born between here and here are going. It was kind of like here in Canada, it's like, I always remember our, our BSM at the time. He's like, who wants to go overseas? And everybody's hands went up. I'm like, wow, that's pretty cool, man. And by everyone, our unit was like only 17 people. But that's still like a lot of people, and it, it's interesting because it's it's uh, here in Lethbridge, it's like you know, I don't think a lot of people know that we send people overseas too. So I'm like, hey, you know what? That's how simple it was. You just put your hand up, they took your name down, and then that was in December. 
And then by February 2009, they found me a spot. They're like, hey, you're going to Shiloh, Manitoba. Uh, you know, pack your stuff up. And I said farewell to my friends and family. Went to go train for a desert in uh, minus 50 degree temperature because Manitoba is really cold during that time. And uh, but yeah, when I was there, I learned how to drive. And um, I thought I was going to be going over as a gunner, like for these guns. But no, I, my, my journey ended up being a... Uh, a driver for an RG31, which would later turn into an Ayala Cougar. And uh, I learned all the machine guns and how to operate it. And then by the time I deployed overseas, that would have been October 2009, um, I deployed overseas with the uh, 2nd Patricia Canadian Infantry. Um, they're in charge of the provincial reconstruction team, um, specifically the CIMIC organization, which is an acronym for the Civilian Military Cooperation. And our whole role was to basically work with the local nationals in Afghanistan and help build wells and help uh, build school and uh, basically um, kind of doing business at, on the ground there and uh, maintaining peace. And uh, but I would to be the driver for the CIMIC operator. But when I went overseas, you know, there's always that but things change. So I get there and then they're like, all right, cool, you know, um, to fast forward to December 2009. Uh, quite a bit of us, uh, uh, my, my buddies, they hit an IED, right? And so they got, they obviously, they're, they're no longer with us today. And uh, so that was a, kind of changing, actually. It was, it, was, it was a huge change, and you could sense it. And then carrying on into January, uh, collapsed the provincial reconstruction team. I guess that's how I could look at it. Or they moved assets around. And uh, I just remember, for me, what that meant to me as a driver, they're like, Oh, we no longer need drivers. So they were actually going to send me home in January. And I thought to myself, well, you know what? All right, cool. You know, I've been driving all over Afghanistan and I could see some cool stuff. I'm ready to go home. And uh, I kind of kind of felt like a, a, I kind of feel sorry because I remember talking to my mom on the phone and saying, hey, mom, they're sending me home. Right. <clears throat> and uh, but then things change again. Someone had the bright idea of like, why are we sending back this driver? So we're going to keep him. <laughs> and so it just changed just like that. And uh, so I'd say February uh, 2010 is when I started my training for the uh, nah, nah, for the um, MRAP Cougar, which I everyone called it the uh, glorified um, military taxi or the uh, combat tour bus. And uh, I thought it was pretty cool. I've never driven a truck that big before. <clears throat> and uh but it was funny though the team i was working with um because they got collapsed uh, there was a period there where i just kind of did my own thing working around and uh, i didn't know who my bosses were so uh it was interesting just kind of being my own my own troop while i was there and then uh, i got assigned with the uh princess patricia's canadian light infantry third battalion specifically their jump company and i always found that interesting because i'm like I remember going in there and reporting into our new sergeant major, and he was like getting mad at us. And he's like, "This is what sergeant majors do. They're really good at that, keeping the tone going." And I, uh, I just remember sitting there, and then like all these guys look really checked out, and the way they were, they were talking, and their lingo was just different. And then I was like, "Oh wow!" And then of course they like have all these patches, you know, airborne this, airborne that, and then uh, they're all talking like jump talk, right? And I'm like wow man i'm with the jump company <laughs> like what i uh, never sit up straight oh my gosh you know these guys are these guys are the the, the, the top the top oh my goodness <laughs> and i get to work with them because they needed a driver <laughs> win uh so i worked with those guys from february all the way so i came back and uh, yeah, you know, we, we travel all over Kandahar province, uh, <clears throat> been to Panjaway, the scary Panjaway, um, been to Dan District, Argandab. Uh, yeah, and then, uh, geez, just all over the map. Uh, I've even seen the Red Desert from like you know, a kilometer away. You know, it's just, uh, it, was, it was a beautiful country to be in. Uh, I always remember it and uh, learned a lot from the local nationals too. And uh, but yeah, then I came back overseas came home and then uh then my journey kind of takes a turn for the worse uh so i i did my leadership training in 2014 and you know things upstairs weren't working so well for myself um and i kind of think when i did my leadership training in 2014 it triggered i didn't realize it was triggered at the time 
but it brought up a lot of emotions for me. And then fast forward to uh, 2016, you know, hit hit the uh, hit the old bottle pretty hard, as people would say. And I kind of didn't know what was going on with me. And then um, finally, I got some help. You know, I finally fessed up to my leadership. I'm all like, hey, you know, I'm not feeling too good. Uh, and at this time in my life, I always thought the military would like, if you show weakness, the military would be like, you're done, right? I think uh, on my leadership at the time, when I first joined, they're like, if you get PTSD, and I always remember people would tell me, if you say you got PTSD, don't say it, your career will be over, like you're done, like you're useless. And that's the belief I carried, right? But I had enough, right? Like uh, my friends were dying, you know, suicide was high. And I hated reading it on the newspaper. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, it's going to happen to me. And, uh, you know, life just wasn't going good. And uh, I finally fessed up, you know, got a tap out. And there was a lot of uh, a lot of um, a lot of help, ironically enough. And um, so, yeah, I went now the military helped me. They sent me to uh, help me get over my uh, alcohol abuse. Right. Um, went through a divorce, obviously. And I had to get back to school and they helped me finish my schooling and uh, there's a lot of support and it's different because like I'm like looking at my leadership I grew up with and I'm like how come my leadership never told me about this stuff like I think I would have fessed up back in 2014 <laughs> and then not carried so far but you know I guess I chose the hard route and um and you know, I guess it's unfortunate my leadership probably didn't know of all these amazing services that the military had to offer but uh, the military from 2016 to 19, they really worked with me. They rehabilitated me. They sent me to counseling. They paid for my counseling. Um, they changed my work schedule around. And I thought that was really nice. Um, I went from military stuff. And they actually uh, posted me to the cadet unit that I'm from on the reserve. It's uh, the cadet 2384, um, Kainai. And I was like, cool. So my boss was like my... Uh, well, her name's uh, Susan Brewsthead, and she taught me cadets when I was in cadets. And so it was like kind of funny. And I'm like, oh, all right, it, here's an army guy working with a cadet unit. And I thought that was pretty sweet. You know, I didn't have to report into the military anymore. And and it's really nice that they had the military had that service. It really switched my uh, my work routine around. And, uh, you know, working with a bunch of young minds, it was like really, really helped me just to work with my youth from my reserve and then. Uh, yeah, that was a really good year and a half doing that. And then, uh, yeah, then I thought maybe the military was going to medically discharge me because it's true. A lot of a lot of men or women get discharged for having a mental illness or a, 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 what they call an operational stress injury. So I thought to myself, well, you know what? I, uh, I kind of accepted it, right? And then uh, I'd say uh, March 2019, uh, the... Uh, the military decided to keep me with restrictions, they call it, right? And so I'm like, cool, I don't know what that means. And they're like, you get to still serve. I'm like, right on. So I, I must be doing good. And it just seemed like life started getting better. And uh, so, yeah, I, I finally was able to wear my uniform again with pride. And uh, I thought that was really sweet. And then uh, worked my, worked my well, I had to work hard at it. And then uh, my unit finally promoted me to sergeant. And I was like, wow, man, it's pretty crazy. You know, like, I don't think I'd, uh, I don't know if any, too many people are at the rank of a, a sergeant from my community in Canada anyway. So, um, so it was a lot of, it was interesting there. And so I, uh, I always remember too, when I came back, it seemed like I came back, like just nothing, like all the tools I learned from my, uh, going through, I went through from 16 to 19 there through the, um, the having an OSI, uh, I learned a lot. And I was like, wow, I, every day I use that in my life, right? I'm like, this is so cool. I wish I knew this stuff before I went to Afghanistan. Like, this is, this is some good stuff to have, but that's all right, though. You know, I can't beat myself up. I was only 20 at the time when I deployed, right? So and anyway, so, yeah, when I came back that fall 2019, uh, it was really nice. Uh, the, I got assigned to um, some brand new gunners from the unit, and uh, we went and did a, an exercise, and we all won this trophy together, and it was uh, it was pretty cool. You know, they they uh, it was like, hey man, <laughs> I went from you know really messed up to like winning this trophy, and like it was kind of a really high point in my, my career. It's just like winning this trophy, and I'm like, wow, you know what? I've never been a top soldier of the year from our unit and all that stuff, you know. But like, 
I won this trophy and like, this is pretty cool. I took a picture of it, took a picture of the guys I did the training with. And, uh, you know, I'm like, wow, man, so anything possible. Once you put your mind to it, uh, once you kind of can put your traumas aside and kind of work through it, you know, it's kind of like the highlight that I, I kind of take away from uh, being a sergeant now. I was like, yeah, it's been a, been a blast. You know, I'm really grateful that I told my chain of command too, like, despite knowing if they were going to kick me out or not, like, you know, even if they did, I know my life would have still been really good, right? Like, if they said, all right, you're, you're, too, you're too damaged, you got to go. I know my life would still be good because my life is actually really great today. So, but yeah, and then uh, these last couple of years now, from 19 to now, uh, obviously the pandemic hit, right? And uh, our training schedules got modified and tweaked, and we went to a virtual setup like this. And uh, so, yeah, it was, uh, it was nice and, you know, but that's basically it. And then uh, our training exercises are interesting because, you know, you like show up and it's like, man, we don't really get to do the physical work up to an exercise, you know, but you just kind of show up and kind of hope for the best. And I'm like, wow. So, you know, having our leadership around is like, hey, you know what? I got to know what I'm doing. I got to read my notes. I'm always studying. You know, I'm trying to keep, you know, I always find it funny when I talk to my troops now. I'm like, hey, uh, do you know uh do you guys know how to record the howitzer into the center of arc? And then they kind of look at me like joking, but I'm like, well, I'm, I'm testing you. <laughs> it's a test. And, uh, but the idea is what I really like where the military has moved is, uh, you know, it's, uh, we're, 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 we're forever learning and nobody's perfect. And that's what I like. And so, so yeah. Um, and, uh, now I don't know where I'm going to go with this there. So, yeah, that was it. My uh, now I'm just here and uh, what was that? And do you remember the other point I want to talk about? Um, no, I think that the biggest thing was um, that I remember I was talking about was and and also the thing that amazes me so much is how the military really supported you through the PTSD. Yeah, and that. You know, we we and certainly I am part of that. Have this image of the military not doing that. That as soon as you mm -hmm. show that you have PTSD, well, off you go. We're done with you. And it's really nice to mm -hmm. hear that. You know, th that mm -hmm. that's really not the case. Yeah, yeah. That was that was it. So I, you know, I guess at the end of the day, I'm, I'm glad I went through all that. And uh, I don't know what else I could have done, but like, there's lots of cool weapon systems I got to shoot. Um, and I guess at the end of the day too, I, I got reacquainted with my, my culture too. Hey, so, uh, I had to like learn how to pray again, had to learn how to smudge again. And it's really interesting. It just kind of seemed like one day, like I stopped doing all this stuff. Right. So yeah, I'm, I'm really glad that uh, a lot of my elders from our community were, were accessible and they showed me how to do it again, right? And they were good about it. Everyone's really nice about it. And uh, yeah. And then now I'm just still into primary reserves. My civic job is an accounts payable clerk. So I'm like, I did finish school. So I'm putting my degree to use, it feels right. And uh, yeah. And so that's what, uh, that's what I'm doing now, civilian side. So uh, how did you transition? Like, how does that transition go? Like, I, if, it, like being in the in the reserve means that and any time you could be called up is that right and how would that then yeah. work with your job like does your job know that and mm -hmm. yeah so before i did my interview I, I did let them know in the interview um it's kind of one of those hit and misses actually this is like the, the headaches of being a, a re army reservist some of the guys, they kind of hide the fact that they're in the Army Reserves. <laughs> they don't want to let their employers know because then by legislation, the employers have to cater to the military training. And, uh, for example, they got to give me time off if I got to go do an exercise, right? But at the same time, too, it's like a lot of reservists kind of pay the price of like, okay, I'll burn my annual leave or benefits or like. So it's like I know the reg force is like, oh, yeah, you know, but I'm like, you know what? So it's not like being a civilian and army guy is kind of any different. I I'm always working <laughs> now. I'm burning my annual leave to go do army stuff, you know? So there's like, always that sacrifice and it's like, whatever, that's just like the headache of being an army reservist. But yeah, my, my current employer, I let them know. And that it's like at a time when I would start working in 2018, 
had to let them know about it and they still gave me uh, time to go do my medical appointments and whatnot that I was still seeing for my OSI and uh, yeah, they were pretty chill about it. So yeah, you should be honest with your employers and let them know, but that's what I did. Okay, thank you so much, Preston. There's actually quite a few questions in the queue, but before we get started with the questions, um, I just like to say that our speaker is talking on this subject from his own experience, and he's not able to talk or answer questions regarding Canada's policies or decisions. Um, if, if some of the questions are around that, I will ask Preston, but most likely he may not be able to answer those. Um, and having said that, uh, we'll jump right to the questions in the queue. And we'll start with Terry, Terry Shillington. Preston, what would you say were the highlights and also the lows of your time overseas? Oh, geez. You know, the highlight was uh, probably just, well, A, the scenery. I got to see the world. But uh, there was this, uh, in, in, in Afghanistan, they have a tank graveyard for when the Soviets were there, right? And so they have all their equipment there. And I'm like, wow, man, these guys just kind of parked all this stuff there and just leave it. So everyone called it Taint Graveyard. Uh, there's other, uh, this is a conqueror in the European history. Um, I think it's like Caesar, um, not Caesar anyways, but there's a castle, right? And, uh, it, you know, it's just kind of sitting there. It's in ruins now, well, not ruins, it's just a mountain, but they built a castle into a mountain and in the Afghan history, they like let this king finish his castle. And then once he was done, then the Afghans at that day, they took it over. Right. So I, I thought that was pretty cool. Just like all that kind of history that I never really see. And uh, I think the other highlight was uh, just acknowledging seeing the, uh, the Afghan people, they do pray four times a day and uh, you'd be driving on the road and then be like, Hey man, everyone's pulling over. You know, you'd be the only person on the vehicle because everybody's praying when it's like morning, sundown, you know, goes for, and it's like, so I always found that unique about that. The low points, of course, was, um, I call it my somber New Year's experience, you know, so uh, my sergeant, his name was Kirk Taylor. He got blown up in that explosion in uh, 2009. There's a news reporter, too. Her name was Michelle Lang and uh, George Miak, uh, Chidley and McCormick, you know, they uh, their vehicle got hit. And, uh, you know, at the time I really downplayed it, but like, you know, being over there when you lose your friends, it's like, it's a lot different. And, uh, I don't know. It's really strange, but like you pushed all those motions down, right. You don't want to feel fear or whatever, right. You still want to do your job, but all that stuff did hit me later on. So I'd say that was the, the low point is just, you know, wow, we're, we're still in a war and they're still up for us and just, we're still up for them too. So kind of just realizing the name of the game, the job is, you know, that's what the job is. So, yeah, that's it. Okay, our next question comes from Laurie Schultz. You mentioned you had wished leadership had told you some things about PTSD effects affecting your career. What would you have liked leadership to tell you and your comrades? Um, geez, uh, I wish they would have, like, had the, tools that I have and and learning about empathy right I'm like I put myself in their shoes and I'm like they didn't do what I did to try to get better and work on the mental health and learn about empathetic communication and try to be so understanding and instead of uh, still doing that old formula of the military of absolute power and ruling kind of through fear and control right and uh, just try to work with me and say like hey you know uh, cause, before you come back, if there's something not right, tell the social worker, okay? And if you work through this, there's still hopes you can still stay in the calf. But if not, this will still help you, Crow Chief, you know, become a better person. You know, I wish there was that dialogue. So, yeah, that, I wish it was would have been more like that. Okay. Our next question comes from Mark Goodall. Did you get to know any Afghani interpreters who might still be in the country? Do you, do you any who, do you know, I don't know what the sentence means. Do you any who were able, oh, <laughs> and as I'm reading it, the message gets the deleted, interpreter. Well, the message got deleted. <laughs> so Mark. I think, I think, 
Yeah, okay. Mark just deleted his question. Uh, I'm sure he's going to repost it, but go ahead and answer the first part anyway. You, you know what? Uh, the interpreters, I did know some interpreters. There's this one interpreter, everyone called him Lucky. And he was a pretty cool guy, you know? Um, it, it was interesting because he is like, he like ate what we ate. They kind of get to eat. They, they live with us on base, the interpreters that we hire. And uh, they do everything we do. And it was, it was funny looking at his before pictures and after photos. Like he, he's all jacked. Hey, he would go to the gym. And, you know, he was. And uh, I, I remember one time asking him, I said, hey, you know, Lucky. And I don't know his real name. Every day I'll have nicknames, right? And I think they had nicknames to kind of protect their identity and whatnot. But uh, his name was Lucky. And the, the, why they gave him the name Lucky is I guess he's had a lot of near calls, right? Like, you know, like explosions or whatever and he's it, he was really cool about it he's just everyday life for this guy right and uh i asked him like oh, why, why are you doing this and a lot of those interpreters um they get paid pretty good um from uh canada or the u.s or any of our allies but yeah he just said he's saving up his money to have enough to move his whole family to canada so i don't know if lucky actually moved to canada but that it's kind of the name of the game when I was talking about a lot of the interpreters is they're trying to save up so they can move their families. Right. Mark reposted this question. And the second part of the question is, do you perhaps know any who were able to get to Canada? So I know you said you didn't know Lucky made it to Canada, but do you know anybody who made it to Canada? No. no. Um, our next question comes from Clint Peterson. Thank you very much, Preston, for your willingness to talk about your experience. How do you feel about Canada's exit from Afghanistan? <laughs> That's a pretty good question. How do I feel about it? You know, it's like a little bit of a, wow, it's just done, you know, kind of like an awe, right? But same time, it's like, well, that's uh, above my pay grade, you know, so I'll leave it at that. <laughs> okay. Um, Leona Jacobs, was there a specific event that resulted in a PTSD? A specific result? Jeez, uh, so I guess I could say all of it, yeah. I could say all of it, like everything. Like, I remember deploying overseas and, uh, you know, I was really uh, upset about my siblings um, for not showing up to say, goodbye, Preston, hopefully you come home, right? And they, just my mom and dad and my grandpa did, right? But none of my siblings decided to take the time out of their lives to wish me farewell. You know, so like there's that uh, little, there's that episode. I had to work through that. Um, of course, like the, the girl I really liked at the time, you know, decided to leave me while I was overseas. And, you know, that's a common theme. So I guess for a 20 year old, and I look back at 20 year old Preston Young, like, yeah, that's the stuff that I had to kind of work through. But the actual traumas himself would have been the, uh, I call it the somber New Year's. Um, and then, Later on, there was uh, another event that happened to me. Um, there's this individual, uh, I believe his last name is Baker. But um, yeah, we went to this training actress, this training field, and you know we're um, basically shooting a mountain, practicing, getting ready for a future operation, and working with the equipment we we're going to work with. And it was just so so interesting that when we left, another call sign seen where we were at. And so they must have deemed like, hey, we're going to go use the exact same spot, right? And so where they parked, I guess they're using some claymores and, you know, a uh, friendly fire incident happened. But like, I guess this claymore went off and then like a massive explosion went up, right? And then like, and I always remember driving. And of course, when I drive, I get to hear like all the chatter across the whole net in Afghanistan. And they're talking about this. And I'm like, and then later on in life, that part kind of hit me. I'm like, you mean there was an IED there that whole time? Like we ran all over that field. Like how did we not hit it? You know. So there was a lot of those moments. Uh, another moment that like always makes me kind of cringe is like culverts. Hey, so when I came home, like oh I couldn't like look at a culvert and I'd like freak out and I'd like you know start panicking inside. Outside I'm okay, but you know I had to get over culverts because culverts they would uh, the, the insurgents would put IEDs under culverts and. The only way to beat a culvert is you stop and somebody goes and they take a look under the culvert. Nothing's there. Get in. Go on. Uh, but that's, I don't know, the, the word is like false sense of security for me because there was this one culvert. We stopped. We, our guys got out. They took a look. All right. Good to go. They got back in. We roll over the culvert. 
and then there was a tank call sign behind us, one of Canada's Leopard 2s. They, they seen us clear that culvert, you know, and we, they're not far behind us. They, they could see us. They're like, oh, cool. And they were going to roll over that exact same culvert. And then when they roll over that exact same culvert, that culvert exploded, eh? And I'm just like, and I look over at our, our crew commander, who so happens to be the, uh, the captain at the time, and he's like, that's so strange. I thought the guys checked out the culvert. And, you know, I'm like talking to the guys. I'm like, I thought you guys looked in there. And then they kind of have that look like we did. But, like, maybe they didn't look good enough or, you know, so, like, so it's interesting. So it's, like, you know, you got to really uh, have each other back, right? So near misses like that. Um, there's another near miss that I had was uh, there was this, um, I call it a sand castle. So when we were on patrol, I had a buddy of mine. And I remember looking at it. I'm like, wow, that's pretty cool, right? I'm looking at this sand castle. I'm like, I didn't know kids play with sand castles around here, hey? And then he's like, sand castle? He just found that just out of the, you know, completely out of number. Because you got to pay attention to the pattern of life. And a lot of kids don't play the sand castles there. He walked over. He's like, Crow Chief, there's a big ID under that sand castle, right? So what ha- happened is an ID that was planted there. And then through time and withering and blowing, you could start seeing uh, an IED surface, right? So that's what I was looking at. But I thought it was kids playing with the sand castle. And the funny part is, I look at the, uh, I looked at the, uh, the compounds over there. All the kids are standing there watching us, and they're doing this, right? <laughs> they're like waiting for it to go off. And I was like, "Oh man, <laughs> run!" <laughs> so yeah, it's stuff like that that kind of comes back, and I go, oh, okay, I'm glad I'm still alive," you know? Yeah, we are too. We're glad you're still alive. <laughs> um, Lori Schultz. Where were adults involved in your rehabilitation period? Uh, adults elders, involved? sorry. Were elders. Elders, yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, so when I uh so when I so part of my recovery plan was I, I talked to like a psychologist, mental health nurse. Um in fact there's a clinic in Calgary, right? It's called the Operational Stress Injury Clinic. That's pretty cool. They have a lot of services. And, uh, you know, the, the mental health nurse I work with, uh, she's like, do you ever want to talk to elders? I'm like, and I didn't want to talk to elders because, like, they're just, for me, they're just people from our community. And I'm like, I don't want the whole world to know about PTSD. You know, you're kind of going through this element of shame, right? And so my, my mental health nurse had to, like, really hammer down what shame was and just kind of how to deal with it. So, but once I got over that, yeah, I was able to basically approach my friends grandparents basically and, and i don't want my friends to know right but yeah i went to uh i went to one and she educated me on the concept of like prayer um forever prayer and um she she told me about this uh things happen for a reason so you know you gotta believe things happen for a reason Preston. And, you know life was just like terrible for me at that time right and uh went to another elder i went to him quite a bit of times actually and he uh yeah, he was just always telling me to pray and, you know, he wanted to keep praying. And then he started talking to me about um, uh, our medicine wheel. So, like, he's like, in the Western world, they really concentrate on the physical part of the medicine. No, no, Preston. He's like, he's like, there's not going to be a pill for everything, Preston. You know, you got to do some spiritual work. And he promised me, he said, if you work on your spirit, it's going to fix your emotional health. It's going to fix your mental health. And you know what? The, once those two are fixed, then your physical health will eventually get better. But he's like, you could, you know, I was still kind of trying to drink at the time. He's like, you could drink all you want, right? You still got to deal with it, you know. Still got to deal with those emotions and whatnot. And so I'm really glad I had to sit down and talk to those two elders. And, uh, yeah. And then just throughout, you know, I run into elders. I used to go talk to my elders a lot. And they'll see me and they'll. they'll He's still praying. So a lot of our elders in the community just encourage me to keep praying and keep doing what I'm doing. But those two specific elders that I dealt with, yeah, I had them, went to them, like, we'll say to work regularly, right? And then they'll send me on my way and work on the concept of spiritual growth. Okay, our next question comes from Candace Driscoll. Thank you for sharing your experience mm-hmm. with us, Preston. What advice would you give to the troops regarding the stigma of PTSD and seeking help? 
Oh, geez, advice. Um, not supposed to give advice, but you know what? Uh, just do what I did. Step forward, talk to your leadership, and uh, it's up to your leader to uh, find, help you find those sources for assistance. That's it. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Jim Miller, thank you for your service. Do you recommend to other Indigenous youth on the blood reserve to consider going into the military as a career? Uh, yes, I do, actually. Um, I do. I, uh, I do recommend it. Uh, one of my famous words that I always carried with me was my uh, master corporal from my soldier qualification. And we were doing this, like, I don't know, a, a hike, right? And really cool stuff and attacks and whatnot. And he said, people pay good money to do this stuff. You guys get paid for it. And I'm like, hey, that's so true. You know, like everything I'm doing, people pay good money for this. And I'm getting paid by the crown to, you know, section attack up a mountain and hike through a mountain and do all this stuff. And, you know, uh, but, you know, for the indigenous youth, um, you know, I had my I had my right. And I think a lot of our people think that, like, the military is racist. Right. And uh, when you join the military, I guess you could say each unit is very unique. Right. So my unit in particular was very unique. Uh, a lot of older uh, generational soldiers from, like, I don't know the baby boomer era, right? And so happened to be all white men. And, uh, you know, their their native jokes were a little bit too far, right? And I know they're trying to be in the bit of the spirit. But uh, I did get to that point where um, it was actually when I started working on myself too, right? In 2016, 15 era, 14. I thought, you know what? I had enough, right? You can't be calling me chief, you know? I, you know, I'm tired of all the native jokes. Let's cut it out. But like, I had control over my peers that I did training with, right? The privates, gunners, corporals, master bombardiers, because we, you know, we all hang out together. But it was like this older generation of soldiers, you know, the the, the sergeants and above, right? Who were, you know, my, my people who trained me, and they, I, I don't think they really knew about what I was going through. So I remember I had to sit down and do like a, like kind of like a, a mediation with one of them, and you know. And I think that was enough message to tell everybody, like, cut it out. No more native jokes. Let's stop this, right? Enough's enough. And uh, and then just recently, the military uh, gave out this uh, training program. Um, it's an online one, of course, because of the pandemic. But uh, I, re I went through it. You know, well worth the three, four hours of reading all the PowerPoint slides and all the videos that it comes with. But it talks about it, it's an Indigenous awareness course, right? And I'm like, wow, man, like a lot of the stuff they talked about is what the elders at the Culture Week talks about at Bold Eagle. And, uh, you know, there's a whole module in there, too, and module 17 of it. I had a good laugh, right? It's like things what not to call First Nation people. And I'm all like, oh, my goodness, I was called every single one of those, right? And I'm not trying to, like, have anyone lose their jobs. It's just like that's the reality of my journey is I, I, I've been called Wagon Burner. I've been called all sorts of names. But like, you know, the military is cleaning its act up. And uh, that's, I think, through this more education. I mean, I think there's a level of reconciliation there that's going on with the military. Of like, hey, you know what? It's not cool to be doing this. So I, I, I like it. So yeah, I would recommend it my, for First Nations people from my community. They, they, they should join. And uh, I think you'll be well taken care of. Laurie Schultz, um, did you have opportunity to develop relationships with the Afghan people? And if so, are there any memories that stand out? Yeah, you know, there's this uh, one individual. Um, well, of course, uh, Lucky and his buddies. We played cards together. Um, and then there was another man on the camp. But he got assassinated, though. It's really weird to say that. But, um, yeah, his we called him Popeye. I couldn't pronounce his first name. But he, um, he was just this old man on the camp. And I think the camp that where Camp Nathan Smith was, I think that was his compound. So I don't know how wealthy this man was, but he had like free access to leave the base and come back on the base. And really casually, he'll get on his bike and leave. And But yeah, he was a pretty sweet guy, you know, and he just uh, he didn't speak a word of English. Right. And uh, but our our, uh, our communication was like kind of hand signs, you know, and like he'll like ask if he could sit down with me at the dinner table and stuff like that. And. You know, that, that's it. Just kind of look at each other. And I took a picture of him before I deployed overseas, too, before I left home, because I was like, wow, man, like, 
a pretty chill old man, right? But then when I left, from what I can gather, you know, because I still kind of kept a few people there, like, yeah, you know, uh, you know, Popeye, you know, he, he was assassinated. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So, you know, that hit home too. I'm like, man, this guy never spoke English. I didn't really speak too much Pashto, but like, you know, we got along great. And, you know, he kept a good camp and, you know, he's a good business person to do business with. So that's just the nature of life over there. Uh, Bridge City News. In your experience as an Indigenous Canadian military member, what were some challenges you faced during your time serving in Afghanistan? To which the, a second question comes up as well. Um, and I think you've talked about that. As an Indigenous person, did you ever feel any kind of racism directed towards you from fellow soldiers? So, Yeah, yeah, there's that... Uh... Uh, yes and no. It's kind of interesting. When you deploy overseas, it's like you have this really tough mindset. You know what I mean? Like it's there's really no time to be up in your feels when you deploy. So like that's why I said like you just kind of push that all away and just like get the job done. And like I'm not wasn't any better either too, right? I had uh, cracking jokes and like, but um, nobody treated me any different except like there was this one time like it was a uh, when I when I started learning how to drive right i was a gunner but then like uh just the way those guys talk they're like oh man you know this this french guy doesn't know how to drive you know and i'm sitting in the back and they're like get the big indian into the driver's seat let's give him a shot and i'm like but i just started working with those guys right and then that's the hard part that i had to go through is like how come i had to learn how to work with all these brand new people and that seemed to be have been a common theme throughout my career so like I always considered myself kind of that, that outcast. Like, well, we, we have our hub. So, Coach, if you got to go. <laughs> but I'm like, so, you know, there's stuff like that. You know, they just didn't know my name, I guess. But uh, a lot of the guys felt like calling me the word chief because they didn't, they shortened the word Crow Chief and they'd say chief. So there was those in terms of endearment situations. But, like, yeah, there was, but yeah, I guess after working together for so long, you know, like, you get, you kind of develop your own niche, right? But yeah, I don't know. Hopefully that answers this question. Oh, geez, you know what? Uh, it's made me a better father, you know? Um, just looking at my son, I'm like, well, it's not like my son knows how to do everything. So, you know, I have to, like, kind of educate him and, you know, let him how to do. And at the same time, too, letting, letting him have his life, too, because <laughs> he likes to make life decisions that I don't agree with. Like, don't jump off the couch, son. You're going to hurt yourself. What does he do? He jumps off of the couch. He gets hurt, right? Rather than, like, get mad at him about it like you know it's kind of be there and like give him that hug when he needs it and like that so that's what i do and then so, and then sorry what? sorry i had my yeah. mic muted when i asked that question so do you okay. mind if i just re-ask the question um i yeah. had it muted to the audience sorry about that uh, so the question was for for the audience. The question was, "Wow, on the new misses." So having those experiences and having journeyed through the PTSD recovery, what lessons have you learned that you can apply to your daily life at home? Sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Again, <laughs> take two. Uh, so yeah, just it made me a better parent. And you know, for example, like uh, I was telling, uh, like what Anne heard. Uh, yeah, you know. Uh, my son has his own little life. That's some little story about like if he jumps off a couch and I tell him don't jump off the couch, you're gonna get hurt. And he jumps off the couch and gets hurt. It's just kind of like, uh, you know, you kind of just let my son kind of live his life. But uh, you know, I'm there differently. You know, I'm a concept. I love him undoubtedly. I give him the hugs and kisses rather than like, see, I told you, you know. Um, and as well as, uh, yeah, just before this whole. Things started, uh, Ann and I were doing sound checks and whatnot, and I'm like, whew, I had to do some deep breathing exercises, bring the anxiety down, you know, understanding where my anxiety is coming from. So I think that's key is like, uh, you know, kind of have to live with your emotions, right? So I'm like, I'm just anxious because I'm like, 
other people are watching, you know, get out of my head. Um, yeah. So I, I guess that's it. Basically what I took out of all that is just, I, I breathe better, take care of myself better. Um, I'm happier. So, you know, I, I know how to be a better person. So yeah, I, I do use it all. Bridge City News. You mentioned the journalist Michelle Michelle Lang, who was killed in Afghanistan. Four other military members were killed in the blast too. Did that contribute to your PTSD? Yeah. Yes, it did. Yeah, it did. Um, I have my own question, if I may. What was the transition uh, from coming back to Afghanistan? to coming home like that must have been such a stark difference in reality here we're talking you know running around talking about the latest movie and i don't know you know sort of just living our lives while where you have been through this big journey what was that like that transition oh geez yeah that uh let's kind of get thrown into it eh um i do remember getting off the plane when i came home right that, that like when i first got home and uh, yeah, it was just like everyone was wearing all of drab, right? You know, um, camel. And uh, I'm still wearing my tan colors. And I just remember thinking, like, wow, this looks really weird. Everyone's wearing tan colors. Uh, there's cement everywhere, you know, and there's potable water. Uh, I, I was grateful for all the services that we have and whatnot. But uh, the transition, it always seemed like I always had to be busy. Hey. Um, everyone speeds in this country. Oh man, like over there. Um, uh, I think if I got lucky one time, I hit like a hundred kilometers per hour. Right. But trying to drive a 80 ton truck is like pretty hard to hit that speed. So, you know, I got used to driving 60, 80 kilometers an hour, but coming here is like my dad, boom. And I'm like, why are we going 140? <laughs> everyone goes 140 on highway two. You know what I mean? <laughs> So, uh, but yeah, transitioning, uh, I, I think it was just like, it was just kind of in reverse going from like bare essential, um, services to like, wow, man, we live in a country full of abundance, you know, it was like, you know, I'm always eating, you know, fast food restaurants everywhere. Uh, nobody plays outside anymore. You know, nobody wants to go for a run outside. Everyone wants to be at a gym lifting weights. You know, it's like, man, I've been so, I was in really good shape just being in Afghanistan for the amount of walking we did, all the stuff I carried, you know, just like daily living it was like, it came back. I was like, oh, the weights I lift, I've never been like more, more, more you know, strength wise, stronger than me going to the gym daily for two hours. Right. So yeah, it was interesting, but yeah, just lots of services. So it was, it's nice. <laughs> Leona Jacobs, uh, how have others within your community responded to you and your experiences since you've returned? How have they responded? Well, when I when I was talking to Susan, uh, she actually ran up by me when I came back. Well, when I started like doing the PTSD work, right? But uh, I guess there's a period. So when I came back, community did uh, so. I'm a part of uh, my. Um, sacred sacred society we call it the kanatsumi takes brave dog society and i got to tell my four war stories at our sundance and uh you know that was uh, very it was an honor you know um you don't get to do that too often and uh it was it was unique because normally when the vet veteran tells the stories he always leaves the sundance right but because i was a member within the brave dogs i got to just like sit back down so I didn't have to leave. So that was like the only difference. I didn't know how to play that one. I was like, normally I see them leave, but I'm just going to stay, you know? So yeah, I got to tell my, my story there and uh, yeah. And then of course with uh, Susan, when I was working on myself, she's like, we're going to go talk to chief of council and see if we can get this worked out. Right. And uh, you know, to work with the cadets and, you know, chief and council was pretty chill with it at the time. We're like, yeah, go ahead. Make it happen. So. Excellent. Um, before we wrap this up, and uh, there's lots of thank yous here and thanking you for sharing your story, but before we wrap this up, I wonder if you have a take home message for our viewers today. Oh, geez. Uh, no take home message. I, I, other than, you know, I guess I want to say I'm grateful to be here today. Thank you all for listening. 
And uh, I don't know if you if you learn something or if it unlocks some kind of new length of training, but like I, I I'm just really glad that I went through what I went through, and uh, hopefully uh, hopefully it helps you guys some find some strength and hope to carry on the daily battle, the courage to do battle on the daily, and yeah, that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you for uh, sharing your story with us here at SACPA. And um, I just want to read Laurie Schultz Preston. Thank you for your strength in sharing your story and for your service. All are the richer for it. Thank you. And then Jim Miller. Thank you, Preston, for a very interesting talk. Congratulations on your great career within the military. Leona Jacobs, this has been fascinating. Thank you for sharing your experience with us. And Candace Driscoll. Thank you again, Preston. It's been a great hearing your story and experiences. I look forward to hearing more. And also on behalf of SACPA and also on behalf of myself, thank you so much. It was very powerful. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Um, and for our viewers, we hope that you will join us next week, Thursday, with Larry Elford on farming humans. And we'll see you next week. Thanks. <laughs>